Welcome to First Grapevine, a United Methodist Church. We're glad you have joined us for worship in person or online. Please take a moment and register your attendance by either filling out one of the registration cards or online through our church website, firstgrapevine.org, or our mobile app. Good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here. I don't know what your week consisted of, but mine consisted of an official vacation. But if you vacation like me, you come back sore, like you need a rest. We boated on Lake Travis. We went to Schlitterbahn and rode water slides, and we tubed in Guadalupe. And I realized the last time I did all that stuff, I was a much younger man. Now that I'm in my 40s and I've got teenagers of my own, it reminds me of when I was in my 20s dealing with some of your teenagers. And I would always look at you and think, come on, catch up. They need you to be more involved and active in their lives. And what's the matter with you? You sore? Now I understand more, and I'm going to apologize to each one of you for uh, anything I ever said to you that might have indicated I thought you needed to work harder. <laughs> that does show you how long I've been involved with this congregation, and really I've been involved with the United Methodist Church my whole life. And I grew up with a church choir in the choir loft singing songs, and some of them were sad and some of them were happy. This one right here is a good, happy song that's about an old church choir singing in my soul. So why don't y'all stand up and we can get worship started this morning with a little excitement. This revival is pretty. Like a wildfire in my heart Sunday morning, hallelujah It is lasting all week long Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of the gospel song Once you choose it, you can't lose it There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna stop I got to tell you, we're moving a little slow this morning. Didn't I just tell you that I was going to apologize for saying that in the past? But turns out it's true. I don't know why I can play, uh, I can play a saloon at nighttime full of people singing out loud, dancing around. And we come to Sunday morning church and uh, there's 
space for everyone to spread out as much as you want. We're kind of moving slowly. I just think those things are, I think those things are backward. That means we've got some work to do. If you agree with me, we've got some work to do, church. Why don't you say amen? Thank you so much. I'm going to invite Alan up here to continue our service, but the first thing he's going to say is you can have a seat now if you want to, but you don't have to. 
So I won't say that because you're already seating. I'm going to ask the ushers to prepare for our morning offering and just remind me that you're, you remind you that our, your generosity is what helps make all the exciting things happen in this church, not only locally in our own community, but all around the world. Let us pray. Most loving and merciful God, we just give you thanks for this day, for your creation, and for your goodness, and the fact that you have put goodness in us. Help to empower us to be that light on the hill, to shine that goodness and that grace to a world in need. Lord, we know that there are those among us who need your special healing and comforting presence. We ask you to be there for them, but also allow us to be there for each other. Lord, in all of the dark places in the world, the war in Ukraine, violence all around, fear, may your light be stronger than all of that darkness. Thank you for all the blessings that you have given us and the ability to be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me that I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter, I'm the canvas and the clay. You make all things work together for my future, for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for
our failings and our successes, you are working. You are working to build your kingdom. You are working, working to heal our heart. You are working to enable us to heal your world. Help us remember when we see people outside this building, they need to know that you love them. They need to know that you're calling them. They need to know that you care for them. And God, when I forget that that's my job to do for you, when I forget that's the purpose you've laid for me, when I forget that I'm beautifully and wonderfully made in your image, when I doubt, Lord, remind me that I'm a wonderfully me. You're in us, and in a part of I'm a canvas and a clay. And I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're in us, and in a part of I'm a canvas and a clay. God, we ask that you pour your spirit out on this, our holy offering to you this Sunday morning. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. You're not finished with me. You're not finished with me yet. So when I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm a wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm a canvas and a clay. And I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. Amen. Welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here. This is the time when we invite the children to come down to the front and find Monica up here. You might have to look a little extra hard this morning, but here she is right here. <laughs> here, let's go around this way. There's lots and lots of cords. I don't want y'all to trip. We'll go around the other way. All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to come over here, too. All right. I'm so glad to see you guys today. All right. You want to sit here with me? Hello, hello. All right. I'm so glad y'all are here. All right, I have a question for y'all. If you guys have been here sometimes this summer, we've been talking about the fruits of the spirit, right? Do y'all remember that? Who can help me do like a quick review? What are some of the fruits of the spirit we've already talked about? What are a couple? Kindness and peace. Kindness and peace. What else? Joy. Joy, that's a good one. All right, we've done love, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And today we're going to do goodness. You saw the grapes over there. We're doing grapes. So for goodness, what do you guys think about goodness? When you hear that word, what does that mean to you? Hold on. I'll ask you for help in a minute. Um, what do you think of when you think of that word? Or what do you think of it means to have goodness or to show goodness? What do you think? Um, to, to show goodness, I think, is like um, uh, giving, like helping somebody or helping, yeah, helping somebody. Yeah, helping somebody. That's a great one. You know, I kind of think goodness is a bunch of the ones we've already talked about combined, right? Because if you're good, you're going to be kind, you're going to have joy, you're going to show love, all those things. So our scripture today, they're going to talk about goodness. It's Jesus talking, and he's talking about a whole bunch of stuff. One of the things he says is that he talks about a lamp. And he says, when you turn on a lamp, do you put like a bowl over it? 
No, you wouldn't do that. When you turn on a lamp, you don't like, do you put it like in a closet? No, because the lamp, it's to show light, right? It's to shed light all over the place. And I think that's so funny because did you see we have all these extra lights today? Do you see them? From now you can see them from the front. There's all kinds of lights going on. It's because some of our lights went out. And so today when we're talking about sharing God's light, there's all these lights that are up. Because when some of the light goes out, we bring in new light, right? We don't just say, okay, well, we're just going to sit in the dark. No, we get some new light, right? So Jesus is talking about that. And then he says um, that we are like a lamp. And we shine our light with our goodness to show other people about God's goodness. And that made me think of this candle that I've seen on TV. Um, have any, hold on. Oh, thank you. Has anybody seen a candle like this on TV? Okay. I have never done this before, which is what you want to hear when I'm about to light something on fire. I've never done this before, but we're going to try it. Because when I was thinking about this scripture and I was thinking about what to talk to you guys about, I thought of this candle. So you can hold this for me. Hold it up to my face for me a little bit. So I'm going to light this candle and we're going to, um, y'all are going to see what happens, okay? Okay, here we go. We're not going to be scared. We're not going to worry. Okay, look at it go. <gasps> look at that. Do you see how that one light in the middle, it turned into all these other lights? Isn't that crazy? So that's like you guys. You guys are that light. Jesus is that light in the middle, and he shows all of his goodness and kindness and love to us. Hold on. And then when we bring that goodness into our lives, we get to share it, and we can spread it around to all. Look at all that. That's a lot of light. I was kind of, hold on. I was kind of glad that the lights were kind of out today because you can see it even better. So when you guys think about, y'all are about to go back to school, and that's a big deal, right? You're all going to go to a school, and you're going to have a chance to share God's light and God's goodness with other people, all right? Oh, boy. All right, so I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to blow it out, because it's not fair, because we can't all blow it out, because then we just blow germs on each other, and we're just not going to do that. So, all right, let's pray, okay? Dear God, thank you so, so much for this day. Thank you for a chance to be together um, at church with our church family. God, thank you for those of our family who are watching from home. God, we are so grateful for your goodness to us, for your kindness and your love that you show us every day. God, I pray that as we go through our week, we would be a light for you and that we would share your goodness with others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, next slide. Thank you so much, Monica. This is the third Sunday of the month, and that is when we are privileged to have a special uh, guest come and read scripture. And this is Wade Heine, and he's one of our Stephen ministers, and this is a good time for me to remind us all that we are not walking through this life alone. Uh, sometimes we hit some hard patches, and we need someone to talk to just to get things off of our chest, someone who will listen to us, who will pray with us, and the Stephen ministers are just those types of people. So if you feel the need uh, just to have someone for a short term or for a long term, uh, just to walk with you through something. That's what our Stephen ministers are here for. So, Wade, thank you for reading our scripture today. Okay. Hey, all right. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand, and, and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people, so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A tree, vine, or bush can be identified by the kind of fruit it produces. The Bible often describes a person's actions and thoughts that give evidence of a godly or ungodly life as fruits. This summer we will be looking at the fruits of the Spirit, the attributes listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which are characteristic of a life led by the Holy Spirit. Each week we will focus on a particular spiritual fruit and a familiar edible fruit that begins with the same letter to help us remember all the fruits. This week's fruit of the Spirit is goodness. 
and the reminder of fruit are grapes. The Bible teaches that God wants good things for us as his children. The presence of the Holy Spirit helps us to show the goodness of God to others as a fruit of his character. The next time we enjoy the treat of sweet, juicy grapes, beginning with the letter G, may we be reminded of the sixth fruit of the Spirit, goodness. Now we're talking about that light. And I'll tell you from my perspective, there is nothing over any of these lights up here. I can't see you out there, which is different for me. So I will need a little feedback <laughs> as we move through uh, today's, today's lesson. There's a story that goes, uh, a young man named Will Novak, who lives in Phoenix, Arizona, and he had a 10-month-old daughter at home when one evening he received an email from Devin, all about a bachelor party for Devin's brother, Angelo. It was going to be a 80s-themed ski weekend in Vermont. It sounded like a lot of fun to Will. The problem was he didn't know anyone named Devin or Angelo, and they'd never been to New Jersey where they live. Someone had made a typo on the email distribution list. And so they were asking for $150 to help pay for the food and other fun stuff for the trip. And, of course, there was the need to fly to Vermont for the weekend. So Will thought about deleting it and just moving on and chuckling like most of us would do. But uh, just for fun, he responded. So, you know, I don't know Angelo, but he sounds like a great guy. This sounds like a fun weekend, and I'm in. I want to help send him off in style. Any chance you could waive the 150 since I don't know any of you? And he sent that off, never expecting to hear from Devin again. And much to him, his surprise, Devin responded, I talked to everyone, and we all agree that you should come, and yeah, we'll waive the 150. Well, that wasn't expected. So after talking to his wife, she agreed that it might be a good thing to get him out of the house for a while. And so the plan was on. The problem was, as he was looking into it, the flight to Vermont was super expensive. So... You know, again, just for fun, he started up a little GoFundMe page, asking for the 750 and went down for dinner. Finished eating dinner, and about two hours later, he went up and just out of curiosity, clicked on the GoFundMe page, and he'd raised $900. So he flew to Vermont, and he had a great weekend making new friends and enjoying himself. I like reading stories like this. These kind of unexpected adventures and unexpected connections that, that happen in our world. You know, we spend a lot of time focusing on the badness, the negative. Even up here from this stage, you know, we can complain about the things that, that put us down, the, the work troubles that we have, the, the people that were mean and aggressive on the highway as we're driving, those that that cut us off at the grocery store. But what about all the good things? What about the, the little small things? What about the person that lets you in in traffic? We focus on that, all the, the small random acts of kindness, the small random acts of goodness that happen in the world on a daily basis if we just open our eyes and look for them. And so today, as, you, as you've been told, there are grapes on the altar, and we're going to talk about the fruit of the spirit of goodness. And John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, had three simple rules for being a follower of Christ. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Kind of compounded all of the rules down into those three simple ones, and it sounds easy enough, and it certainly tracks with what Jesus said was the most important commandment, and that is to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. So we come to today's scripture, and this is in the Gospel of Matthew, and this is in the midst of the most important sermon that's ever been preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Right before this passage, 
Jesus lays out the Beatitudes. Now, that's a big church word. Maybe you've heard blessed are the meek. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus spends a lot of time blessing those who the church at the time had kind of turned their back on, had set off to the margins. They didn't need people who were poor in spirit. They didn't need those that were poor, those that were on the outside. And so they ignored them, and Jesus turns the script on its side and says, no, 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 these are actually the ones that are blessed. These are the ones that God loves, that God walks after or looks after. When God created the world, including us humans, back at the very beginning, back in Genesis, created all of these things, and God looked at each of them, and what did he say? It is good. It is good. This light, it is good. These humans, they are good. And in this sermon, Jesus is reminding all who are listening of that promise from the first of time, that they are good, that we are good, that there is goodness that fills them, and that goodness comes from God. And they aren't to hide that goodness, but rather to let it shine. And as I was writing this, the song was going through my head, it may be going through yours right now, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's what we're supposed to do, and oftentimes those simple reminders are the ones that we want to hear. Now, later on in this story that we are still a part of, the Apostle Paul is planning churches everywhere, expanding beyond this area of ministry that Jesus had, and forming communities of new Jesus followers that can continue to share that light and that goodness in the world. And in order to keep in touch with them, he wrote all of these letters or epistles, and they were to specific churches. And he would hear what was going on in those churches, the struggles, oftentimes the badness that was happening, as what happens when humans get together, and he would respond specifically. He would address those problems and answer those questions. And in his letter to the Colossians, the church there, Paul is letting the church know that in Christ, things are going to be different. And he says in that letter to them, here there is no Gentile or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You know, that idea that there is no Jew, there is no Christian, which wasn't a word yet, there is no circumcised, uncircumcised, you see, up until this point, faith was based on who was in and who was out. There were very strict rules about who was allowed into the kingdom, into the community. And the church was really good about keeping people out that they didn't want. Some things haven't changed a whole lot in certain churches. Paul was talking about this idea of togetherness, of wholeness, going back to that that God created all of you, all of them, and together we are good. That's the reminder that he was showing. In other words, this goodness, that when one becomes a follower of Christ, one will change. One will throw aside all of those preconceived notions or the things that they were taught about the other and throw that all out and become a new person. We'll act differently, speak differently, and even look differently, and he uses the metaphors of clothing it says that we should clothe ourselves in Christ. So that not only that what's inside, but that what inside comes out 
so that when people see us, oftentimes the first thing they see is the clothes. They will see Christ in us as we go about our lives. A lot of you already know that my favorite secular holiday is Halloween. And I know to some of you that may be weird for a pastor to say, but um, it, it's true. And if you drive by my house, um, really September through the end of October, you'll understand that, oh, that's that guy. Yeah, I'm that guy in the neighborhood. Um, because I really get into it, and I, I really love that uh, the, the Christian roots of the holiday, of the All Hallows' Eve and, and, and connecting with the past. Uh, frankly, it's just fun. It's just a fun holiday. And one of the fun parts of, of that is the magic you can see in children as they dress up in costumes and become someone or something different uh, for one night. Now, as I've got... A teenager and an almost teenager, that, that joy is becoming less as I force them, because it is a requirement, um, to participate in this holiday. But there's still joy. Uh, they're still planning on, on what's going to be there. Uh, but just for one night, the, the magic of imagination, uh, the magic of communities and neighborhoods coming together, um, even strangers opening up their doors and handing out free candy. I mean, wouldn't that be great every day of the year? You could just walk down the street and knock on a door, and they'd say, hey, here's some candy. You know, just that, that, that communal idea. At least in our neighborhood, you know, we get together, and we have, this last year, we had a chili cook-off amongst all of the neighbors, and we went from house to house, and then a, a huge mob of us walk through the neighborhood and knock on the doors and visit with our neighbors, and it's just a communal, magical time. This idea of fellowship and being together and freely giving of ourselves. And that idea of this new costume is, uh, since Paul uses metaphors, Jesus uses metaphors, the Bible is full of metaphors, this idea of clothing ourselves in goodness. Of clothing ourselves in the fruits of the Spirit. Because when we get to know God, and when we accept the gift of grace that comes through Jesus Christ then we get to put on a permanent costume. And it no longer becomes a costume, but it becomes our new skin and our new clothing. Eugene Peterson has written a version that's more of a paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. And he puts it this way, For this new life of love, dress in the clothes that God has picked out for you. And I like that. Because I have a wife that picks out my clothes for me. Make sure I don't embarrass the family up here on Sunday morning. And so this idea that, that, that God has already chosen for us the life that we are to have, the mission that we are to live into, that's not something that we chose or had to agonize over. It's something God chose for us. It's that doing good is no longer something that we think we should do and have to try to do but instead becomes just our natural response to everyone. How many of you still open the door for others? How many of you still hold the door open? Say please and thank you. I like the number of hands I can almost see. <laughs> but I did read a study once. There was a, a young man who wanted to do a social experiment study, and so he held the door at a busy downtown office building for an hour and let in like 60 people. And of those 60 people that he opened the door for, less than 10 said thank you. That's sad, I think. But, you know, why, why, why do we do these things? Why do you say please, say thank you, are cordial? You know, I grew up in a small East Texas town. If someone pulls over the shoulder and you pass them, you wave at them. Thank you. Right? It's just what you do. I mean, a lot of that is because uh, many of us were raised right. We had someone in our, in our lives, our mom or dad or grandfather or uncle or some kind of guardian that, that instilled these things in us. So that early on, it's one of those things that you say, hey, don't, remember, you know, don't forget to say thank you. What do we say? Right? That's when you have, little, when you have littles. What do we say? Thank you. Until eventually, you don't have to have anyone to prod you anymore. You just do it. 
My grandfather was a, a big part of my life in, in raising me to who I was. He was in scouts. He was actually um, a lay minister. So like the old circuit riders, he would go and fill the pulpit in small towns when the pastor had to go on vacation. And I still have many of his books that are written. Um, but I do know, and I, I, I remember this, and I'm told by my parents that when I was really little, um, and goodness wasn't what I was exhibiting in public, if you know what I mean, if I was, you know, misbehaving, he would reach down or kneel down and whisper in my ear, and suddenly goodness was flowing out of me. And I, to this day, have no idea what it was that he said. My mom has no idea what it was he said, but boy, I wish I knew what those magic words were sometimes. But that's just what we do, and he exhibited goodness in everything that he did. We all probably have mentors or people that we look up to professionally, in our family, in our church, the saints, if you will, that are just good. If you spent 30 seconds, I guarantee you come up with a list in your head of those people in your own life, whether they're with you or not still. There are just those that do that. And because of those and because of the legacy that is built before us, going all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount, we continue to do these little things that produce life. One of the most famous scriptures, even those that aren't in church, would immediately recognize John 3.16, right? There are signs that are held up at sports games. People have it on their face when they're playing those sports. It kind of is the, the, the scripture for Christianity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. And it's such a, a concise and beautiful statement on God's love. It's a, it's a powerful one, which is why it is, is so often shown out in public. But it's not the whole story because I think it's even more of a powerful one when you include the following verse. John 3, 17. And this all happens when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, who is a church official who has come to find him, uh, to find out more about what he's preaching about, because it sounds good. He wants to know what the big deal is. He comes in under the cover of night, if you remember the story. And if you don't, you can go read it. It's in the, the Gospel of John. And he comes in and says, what, is, what does all of this mean? Because he has recognized that Jesus is talking about something that's good, this goodness that we can all be a part of. And Nicodemus is realizing that, that maybe what he's been a part of, this church at the time, maybe wasn't so good, wasn't doing so many things that were good. And so he asked Jesus what he, what he, what he means to be born again, or as Paul puts it, to put on these new clothes. And so Nicodemus has seen himself as as part of this thing that's just not right. Because the 17th verse, and I'll paraphrase it, is basically God so loved the world, 316, that he gave his only begotten son. And then 17, it goes more, it says, Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the whole world. See, this message is universal. It is for everyone. And in the Jewish understanding of the word eternal, this eternal life that is being offered that Nicodemus is curious about that is fueling this new movement we're not talking about the afterlife because there really wasn't much of a concept of the heaven that we think of now in the Jewish understanding at the time of the faith it was more about living a life abundantly and if you've heard that before Jesus talked about it quite a bit it means to put on these new clothes to naturally do good for the purposes of God that life can change and that goodness will carry on. Building that kingdom of God that is on earth as it is in heaven. It's part of how Jesus taught us to pray, right? We're not just supposed to do all of the good that we can here and be that part of goodness in order to get to an even better place. No, our job is to try to make this place as close to that place as we can. To make this place the kingdom of heaven. 
To make this place what Jesus was preaching about, what Jesus was changing, is to, 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 to show that goodness so that it encompasses the whole world, the one that Jesus came to love and to die for. And so that's why it's important to include that 17th verse, so that the world might be saved through him. It kind of flips the script a little bit, changes God from this vengeful God into a loving and saving one because Christ is all and in all. And all means all. We're all in this together, and I don't just mean in this room or watching at home, but all of us humans working through this thing that we call life. Author Brenning Manning once wrote, I believe the real difference in the American church is not between conservatives and liberals, fundamentalists and charismatics, or even between Republicans and Democrats. The real difference is between the aware and the unaware. Because when someone is aware of that love, the love that God has for us in Jesus, then that person is spontaneously grateful. And when you become aware that you are loved and that you've been loved your entire life and you will continue to be loved no matter what you do because God created you exactly the way you are and said, you, my son, my daughter, are good. Then hopefully that changes your life. It changes your perspective, it changes your interactions, it changes the way that you do things. Cries of thankfulness become the dominant characteristic of the interior life and the byproduct of gratitude is joy, he continues. We're not joyful and then become grateful, but rather we're grateful and that makes us joyful. That awareness of God's love is what allows us to acknowledge our inner goodness and then share that goodness. I hope that you're grateful. I hope that you're joyful. I hope that if you're not, you spend some time considering just what it means because doing good comes naturally with this joy. Another quote that is attributed to John Wesley that you may have heard says, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. It's our job to acknowledge that we're good and remind others that they are part of that goodness. And there are so many opportunities to do good, to do real good in this church, in this community, your own neighborhood, in your own family. Being good and following this man, this God who loves us, unfortunately is not a spectator sport. It's one you got to get off the bench for. It's a game that you've got to get into. So do some good because that's how God created you. Amen. As I invite uh, Josh and the band to come back out, this is just a reminder that uh, this is a good place. And if you've been visiting or if you're unsure about what it means to be part of a community of faith or just need someone again to be with you, uh, we've got people here that would love to talk to you about how to get plugged in, how to do some of that good. Uh, Come find one of us. Come find anybody else that looks like they've been here for a while. No offense to you experienced churchgoers. Uh, This is a good place. And if you need someone to pray with, again, we have Stephen Ministers. I'll be here. Let us pray. Dear God, we just give you thanks for the goodness that you have created in us and the ability to share that good to a world in need. In the name of your loving son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan. As we close our worship today, we're going to sing a song that I know you like a lot. So I'd hope that you'll sing really loud because good when we leave this place to leave with excitement and joy in our heart because we're going to find the real world right outside those doors. 
We're going to find a world that doesn't know God the way we do, but needs to. We're going to find our work waiting for us as soon as we walk out in that parking lot. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. When you called my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of Probably maybe go have lunch with somebody. Maybe you got some evening things figured out that you need to do before you get ready for work tomorrow. When you think of work tomorrow, you know who you're going to walk in and see. You probably know the emails you're going to read, the text messages you're going to get. So as you think about that, as you prepare for that week that's coming up, I want you to think about which one of those people may not know that they are wonderfully and beautifully made in God's image. I want you to think about which one of those people may not know that God paid the ultimate price for them that they could live in His holiness. I want you to think about which one of those people might feel alone, feel like their heart is in a dark place, you to think about which one of those people you might walk up to and say, hey, you know what? I don't know what your plans are for next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, but why don't you let me come pick you up? You can come with me to church and hear about the good news. Because I promise if you think about it, it won't take long to figure out who you need to say that to and who God's landed on your heart to say that to. I've got a few names in my heart right now. But if you're honest with yourself, you have a few names in your heart right now, too. So think about them as we finish singing this song. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broke.
Sometimes one word is enough. Amen.